Do you know the story of Rutherford B. Hayes, the 19th President of the United States? Welcome to BM Research, where we explore fascinating historical figures and their legacies. Join us as we dive into the life of Hayes, from his early days, through his presidency, and beyond into his lasting impact. Part 1. Early Life and Education Rutherford Burchard Hayes was born on October 4, 1822, in Delaware, Ohio, a small but growing town in the American Midwest. His early life was marked by the absence of his father, Rutherford Hayes Jr., who had died just two months before his birth. This left his mother, Sophia Burchard Hayes, in the position of raising Rutherford and his siblings alone. Despite the challenges, Sophia was a strong and resourceful woman who instilled in her children the values of hard work, education, and perseverance. Her determination to provide them with opportunities that her late husband would have wanted was evident in how she approached their upbringing. Rutherford was particularly close to his mother, who played a major role in shaping his character and future. Growing up, Hayes was a curious and intelligent child. His early education was conducted at home under the guidance of his uncle, Sardis Burchard, who had moved in with the family after his brother-in-law's death. Sardis was a wealthy businessman who took a particular interest in Rutherford's education. Under his influence, Rutherford developed a love for learning and a strong moral compass. It was also through Sardis that Hayes came to understand the importance of integrity and responsibility, qualities that would later define his public life. At the age of 12, Rutherford was sent to a local preparatory school, the Norwalk Seminary, where he continued to excel academically. However, it was clear that the local education system would not be enough to satisfy his intellectual curiosity. To further his education, Hayes attended a more rigorous institution, the Isaac Webb School in Middletown, Connecticut. There, he developed a reputation as a diligent student who was always eager to learn. His teachers were impressed by his discipline, and he formed friendships with other students who would later become influential figures in their own right. From Middletown, Hayes went on to attend Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio. At Kenyon, he thrived both academically and socially. He was a natural leader and soon became active in the college's literary societies, where he honed his public speaking skills. His leadership abilities were recognized when he was elected class president, an early indication of the qualities that would later propel him to the national stage. Academically, Hayes was at the top of his class, graduating as valedictorian in 1842. His valedictory address, in which he spoke about the importance of character and virtue in public life, reflected his deeply held beliefs in the importance of personal integrity. After graduating from Kenyon, Hayes briefly considered pursuing a career in business. However, his passion for the law eventually won out, and he decided to attend Harvard Law School. At Harvard, Hayes found himself in the company of some of the brightest legal minds of his generation. The curriculum at Harvard was rigorous, focusing on the principles of constitutional law, contracts, property law, and legal philosophy. Hayes thrived in this environment, and his professors took note of his sharp intellect and analytical abilities. It was here that he began to develop his lifelong belief in the rule of law and the importance of justice in society. During his time at Harvard, Hayes also formed lasting friendships with several of his classmates, some of whom would go on to have prominent careers in law and politics. This network would serve him well in the years to come as he began his own legal career. Despite the intense demands of his studies, Hayes also found time to enjoy life in Boston a vibrant city full of intellectual and political activity. He frequently attended lectures and public debates, further expanding his understanding of the issues facing the nation. His experiences at Harvard not only solidified his legal knowledge, but also gave him a broader perspective on the challenges and opportunities of public service. After graduating from Harvard in 1845, Hayes returned to Ohio to begin his legal career, he initially set up practice in Lower Sandusky, Mater, Day Fremont, but found the town too small for his ambitions. In 1849, he moved to Cincinnati, where he joined a prestigious law firm and began to build a successful practice. 
Cincinnati, a bustling river city, was an ideal place for Hayes to advance his career. The city was a hub of commerce and industry, and Hayes quickly found himself involved in cases dealing with business disputes, real estate, and other civil matters. In Cincinnati, Hayes's reputation as a skilled lawyer grew quickly. He was known for his careful attention to detail, his deep understanding of the law, and his ability to argue cases persuasively. He also became involved in the growing abolitionist movement, representing runaway slaves and advocating for their rights. This work not only reflected Hayes's personal opposition to slavery, but also helped him develop a public profile as a man of principle and compassion. His legal work on behalf of enslaved individuals was often dangerous, given the pro-slavery sentiment in parts of the city, but Hayes never wavered in his commitment to justice. Hayes's legal career in Cincinnati was not without its challenges, however. The legal profession at the time was fiercely competitive, and Hayes had to work hard to establish himself among the city's established lawyers. He often took on smaller cases early in his career, slowly building his client base and reputation. But his diligence paid off, and by the early 1850s, he had become one of the most respected lawyers in the city. His growing success also allowed him to become more involved in the city's political and social life, where he made connections that would prove valuable in his later political career. It was during this time that Hayes began to contemplate a future in politics. While he remained focused on his legal practice, he was increasingly drawn to the political debates of the time, particularly those surrounding slavery, states' rights, and the role of the federal government. His legal work had shown him firsthand the injustices of the system, and he began to see politics as a way to effect broader change. However, his political ambitions would not come to fruition until the outbreak of the Civil War, which would alter the course of his life and thrust him into the national spotlight. Part 2. Legal Career and Early Public Service After completing his formal education at Harvard Law School, Rutherford Burchard Hayes returned to Ohio, eager to establish himself in the legal profession. His initial practice in Lower Sandusky, though successful in the local community, felt limiting to someone with his ambition. Hayes realized that in order to fully realize his potential, he needed to move to a larger, more vibrant city with greater opportunities. In 1849, he relocated to Cincinnati, where he would not only build his legal career but also lay the foundations for his entry into public service. Cincinnati, at that time, was a booming river city, a hub of commerce and industry situated along the Ohio River. Its location made it a gateway between the northern and southern states, and as such, it was a city alive with political, social, and legal challenges. This environment was the perfect proving ground for Hayes, who quickly made a name for himself as a skilled and thoughtful lawyer. His work was diverse, ranging from commercial law to property disputes, but it was his involvement in civil rights cases that began to distinguish him from his peers. Cincinnati, being on the border of free and slave-holding states, was deeply affected by the contentious national debates over slavery. Hayes, a strong opponent of slavery, found himself drawn to cases involving the rights of fugitive slaves seeking freedom. He represented runaway slaves and abolitionist groups in court, often putting himself at odds with powerful pro-slavery interests in the city. This work not only showcased his legal acumen but also his moral courage, as taking on such cases was risky in a society still deeply divided over the issue of slavery. Hayes's reputation as a man of principle grew as a result of these cases, and he became well respected in abolitionist circles. His work in the legal arena naturally led to increased involvement in political debates. At this time, the Republican Party was gaining momentum, especially in northern states like Ohio, where opposition to the expansion of slavery was growing. Hayes, with his firm anti-slavery stance and his belief in the preservation of the Union, was a natural fit for the party. He began to align himself with the Republican cause, attending local meetings and working to advance the party's platform. Though he had not yet officially entered the political arena, it was clear that Hayes was beginning to consider how he might contribute to public life beyond the courtroom. In 1852, Hayes's legal career took an important step forward when he joined a prestigious Cincinnati law firm. This move allowed him to expand his professional network and take on more prominent cases, further establishing himself as one of the city's leading lawyers. 
His work during this time continued to reflect his growing interest in social justice, particularly in the areas of civil rights and the rights of workers. He also became involved in several civic organizations, working to improve the city's legal infrastructure and advocating for reforms that would benefit the broader community. Hayes's time in Cincinnati also marked a significant personal development in his life. In 1852, he married Lucy Webb, a woman whose intelligence, compassion, and strong moral beliefs would have a profound impact on him. Lucy was an ardent abolitionist and a supporter of temperance, causes that she and Hayes would champion together throughout their lives. Their marriage was a partnership in every sense of the word, and Lucy's influence on Hayes was evident in both his personal and professional life. She encouraged him to pursue his political ambitions, and her belief in social justice helped shape his views on many issues. By the late 1850s, with a successful legal practice and a growing public profile, Hayes was beginning to think seriously about a career in politics. The political climate of the time, dominated by the issue of slavery and the impending crisis between North and South, seemed to demand action from those who, like Hayes, believed in the preservation of the Union and the end of slavery. The Republican Party, which had been founded in 1854 on an anti-slavery platform, was gaining strength, and Hayes's views aligned closely with the party's principles. It was during this period that Hayes began to speak publicly on political matters, particularly about the importance of the Union and the need to confront the issue of slavery head-on. In 1860, as the nation stood on the brink of civil war, Hayes was approached by local Republican leaders to run for public office. Though initially reluctant, he eventually agreed, recognizing that the country was at a turning point and that he could no longer remain on the sidelines. His first foray into politics was as the city solicitor of Cincinnati, a position he won with the support of the Republican Party. As city solicitor, Hayes quickly proved himself to be an effective and conscientious public servant. He worked to reform the city's legal system, improve public safety, and address issues of corruption within the local government. Hayes's work as city solicitor further enhanced his reputation as a man of integrity and principle. His moderate approach to governance, combined with his firm stance on issues like slavery and states' rights, made him a rising star in Ohio's Republican Party. As the nation slid closer to civil war, Hayes's legal and political work increasingly intersected with the larger national crisis. He became a vocal supporter of Abraham Lincoln's presidential campaign in 1860, believing that Lincoln's leadership was essential to preserving the Union. Hayes campaigned actively for Lincoln in Ohio, using his legal expertise and political connections to advance the Republican cause. However, even as his political career began to gain momentum, Hayes was not fully committed to the idea of pursuing a long-term career in politics. He enjoyed the intellectual challenges of legal work and valued the relative stability of his professional life. But the events of the early 1860s, particularly the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, would force Hayes to make a critical decision. The war would change the trajectory of his life and push him into a leadership role that he had not originally sought but would ultimately embrace. When the Civil War began, Hayes, like many others in the North, felt a profound sense of duty to defend the Union. Despite his comfortable position as a successful lawyer and local politician, Hayes decided to volunteer for military service. This decision marked a turning point in his life, as it not only demonstrated his commitment to the Union cause, but also set the stage for his rise to national prominence. Hayes's military service would prove to be one of the most defining periods of his life, and it would lay the groundwork for his eventual political career at the national level. Part 3. Civil War Service and Rise to Prominence When the Civil War erupted in 1861, Rutherford B. Hayes found himself at a crossroads. At the time, he was enjoying a successful legal career and a burgeoning political life in Cincinnati. However, the deepening national crisis compelled him to take action beyond the courtroom and political offices. Although he could have continued in his relatively secure role as city solicitor, Hayes felt a profound sense of duty to his country and decided to volunteer for military service. This decision would dramatically alter the course of his life pushing him onto the national stage and paving the way for his future political career. Hayes enlisted as a major in the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry, 
a regiment that would later become famous for producing several prominent political figures, including future President William McKinley. From the very beginning of his service, Hayes proved himself to be a capable and dedicated leader. He was known for his meticulous attention to detail, his understanding of military strategy, and his ability to maintain discipline among his troops. Unlike many officers of the time, Hayes did not come from a military background, but he quickly adapted to the demands of military life. His legal training and experience in public service gave him a strong foundation for leadership, and he earned the respect of his fellow officers and soldiers alike. Hayes's first significant military engagement came in the summer of 1861 during a campaign in Western Virginia, now West Virginia. The 23rd Ohio was tasked with pushing Confederate forces out of the region and securing key transportation routes. In one of his early battles, at Carnifex Ferry, Hayes displayed the kind of personal bravery that would define his military service. He led his troops into combat, often putting himself in harm's way to encourage his men and ensure their success. This willingness to lead from the front earned him the admiration of his soldiers, and he quickly gained a reputation as a fearless and effective officer. Hayes's leadership continued to shine during the Battle of South Mountain in September 1862. This battle, part of the larger Maryland campaign, was a critical engagement that helped prevent Confederate forces from advancing deeper into the North. During the battle, Hayes was severely wounded when a musket ball shattered his left arm. Despite the severity of his injury, he refused to leave the battlefield until he was certain that his men were safely positioned. This act of bravery not only saved lives, but also further cemented his reputation as a leader willing to sacrifice for his men and his country. After the battle, Hayes was transported to a nearby hospital, where he spent several weeks recovering from his wounds. While his injury could have ended his military career, Hayes was determined to return to active duty. After a period of convalescence, he rejoined his regiment in 1863, just as the Union Army was ramping up its efforts to defeat the Confederacy. Hayes participated in several more key battles, including the Siege of Winchester, where his leadership was again on full display. During the siege, he led his troops in a daring raid on Confederate positions, successfully capturing a key enemy outpost and helping to turn the tide of the battle in favor of the Union. This victory further solidified his status as one of the Union Army's most capable and courageous officers. Hayes's military service was not without personal sacrifices. Throughout the war, he was separated from his family, including his wife Lucy and their children. Lucy, a devoted abolitionist and supporter of the Union cause, stood by her husband's decision to serve but often worried for his safety. Despite these challenges, the bond between Hayes and his family remained strong, and Lucy's letters of encouragement helped sustain him during the most difficult moments of the war. Their correspondence provides a poignant glimpse into the personal toll that the Civil War took on soldiers and their families. As the war progressed, Hayes's leadership and bravery did not go unnoticed. In 1864, he was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, a testament to his growing importance within the Union Army, his promotion came at a time when the Union was pushing deeper into Confederate territory, and Hayes was frequently called upon to lead difficult and dangerous missions. Despite the growing toll of the war, Hayes never wavered in his commitment to the Union cause. He remained focused on the larger goal of preserving the United States and ending the institution of slavery, which had torn the nation apart. One of Hayes's most significant contributions during the later years of the war was his participation in General Philip Sheridan's Shenandoah Valley Campaign in 1864. This campaign was designed to cripple the Confederate Army's ability to operate in the critical Shenandoah Valley, a region that provided the South with vital food and supplies. Hayes played a key role in several battles during this campaign, including the decisive Battle of Cedar Creek, where Union forces delivered a crushing blow to the Confederates. Hayes's actions during this campaign earned him further praise and recognition from his superiors, including General Sheridan himself, who considered Hayes one of his most reliable officers. By the time the war ended in 1865, Hayes had risen to the rank of Brevet Major General, a mark of his distinguished service. He had fought in some of the most important battles of the war, been wounded multiple times, and had earned the respect of both his fellow soldiers and his commanders. 
His military service had also elevated his public profile, particularly in his home state of Ohio, where he was seen as a war hero and a man of great integrity. This newfound prominence would prove crucial as Hayes transitioned back into civilian life and began to contemplate a future in politics. The end of the Civil War marked a turning point not only for the nation but also for Hayes personally. His experiences on the battlefield had deepened his commitment to the ideals of liberty and justice, and he emerged from the war with a renewed sense of purpose. He returned to Ohio in 1865, where he was celebrated as a war hero and quickly recruited by the Republican Party to run for public office. Although he had never fully committed to a career in politics before the war, his time in the military had convinced him that he could make a difference in rebuilding the nation. In 1865, Hayes ran for Congress, representing Ohio's 2nd Congressional District. His campaign emphasized his military service and his commitment to the Union cause, and he easily won election to the U.S. House of Representatives. This victory marked the beginning of Hayes's formal political career and set the stage for his eventual rise to the presidency. His time in Congress would allow him to further develop his political philosophy, particularly his views on Reconstruction, civil rights, and the role of the federal government in post-war America. These views, shaped by his experiences during the war, would guide him throughout his political life and play a central role in his presidency. Part 4. Entry into Politics and Governorship Following his distinguished service during the Civil War, Rutherford B. Hayes returned to Ohio in 1865, ready to embark on the next chapter of his life. His military service had earned him widespread respect and admiration, particularly in his home state. Recognizing this newfound prominence, local Republican leaders quickly approached Hayes, encouraging him to run for political office. Although Hayes had long been interested in public service, his experiences during the war had deepened his sense of duty to the nation, and he decided to take up the challenge of entering politics. In 1865, Hayes ran for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives from Ohio's 2nd Congressional District. His campaign was based on his service in the Union Army and his strong support for the Republican Party's platform, which included support for Reconstruction and civil rights for formerly enslaved African Americans. Ohio, like many northern states, was in favor of continuing Reconstruction efforts to rebuild the South and ensure that the newly freed population could enjoy the rights of citizenship. Hayes's reputation as a war hero made him a strong candidate, and he easily won election to Congress. Once in Congress, Hayes quickly aligned himself with the moderate wing of the Republican Party. He supported many of the key legislative initiatives of the period, including the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship to all persons born in the United States and guaranteed equal protection under the law. Hayes's views on Reconstruction were shaped by his experiences during the war where he had witnessed firsthand the devastation of the South and the struggles of formerly enslaved people to gain freedom and autonomy. He believed that Reconstruction needed to be both firm and fair, balancing the need to restore the Southern states to the Union with ensuring that African Americans were granted their full rights as citizens. While serving in Congress, Hayes developed a reputation as a pragmatic and thoughtful lawmaker. He did not align himself with the more radical elements of the Republican Party, who called for harsh punishments against the former Confederate states, but neither did he favor a lenient approach. Hayes's moderate stance made him a trusted figure among his colleagues, and his ability to navigate the complex political landscape of post-war America earned him respect from both sides of the aisle. However, despite his success in Congress, Hayes's time in Washington was relatively brief. In 1867, after serving just one term, he was approached by Ohio Republican leaders to run for governor. The governorship of Ohio was one of the most important political offices in the Midwest, and the Republican Party saw Hayes as the perfect candidate to lead the state during a time of national reconstruction and reform. Initially, Hayes was reluctant to leave his position in Congress, but after some deliberation, he decided to accept the nomination. His candidacy was well received across Ohio, where he was seen as a symbol of integrity, honesty, and competence, qualities that voters sought in the turbulent post-war years. The election of 1867 was a hard-fought contest, but Hayes ultimately emerged victorious, becoming the 29th governor of Ohio. As governor, Hayes focused on rebuilding the state's economy, 
which had been affected by the aftermath of the Civil War. One of his first initiatives was to modernize Ohio's infrastructure, particularly its railroads and transportation networks, which were critical to the state's burgeoning industrial economy. Hayes recognized that Ohio's future prosperity depended on its ability to move goods efficiently across the state and to markets in other parts of the country. His administration worked closely with business leaders to expand rail lines, improve roads, and encourage investment in new industries. These efforts helped lay the foundation for Ohio's emergence as an industrial powerhouse in the late 19th century. In addition to focusing on the economy, Hayes was also committed to education reform. He believed that public education was essential to the future success of the country and that every child, regardless of race or background, should have access to a quality education. Under his leadership, the state legislature passed several key pieces of legislation aimed at expanding and improving Ohio's public school system. Hayes pushed for the establishment of teacher training programs, the creation of more public schools in rural areas, and the introduction of standardized curricula to ensure that students across the state received a consistent and high-quality education. His reforms were widely praised and became a model for other states looking to improve their own education systems. Another area where Hayes made significant progress as governor was in promoting civil rights. Although Ohio was a northern state, it was not immune to the racial tensions that were sweeping the country in the aftermath of the Civil War. Hayes believed that African Americans should have the same rights as any other citizens, and he worked to ensure that Ohio's laws reflected that belief. During his time in office, the state legislature passed laws granting African Americans the right to serve on juries and hold public office, and Hayes supported efforts to integrate the state's public schools. While these measures were not without opposition, they were an important step toward racial equality in the state. Hayes's success as governor did not go unnoticed on the national stage. His moderate stance on Reconstruction, combined with his strong record on education reform and civil rights, made him a rising star in the Republican Party. In 1869, he was re-elected to a second term as governor, further solidifying his reputation as a capable and effective leader, his second term was marked by continued efforts to improve Ohio's economy, expand civil rights protections, and modernize the state's infrastructure. Under Hayes's leadership, Ohio experienced a period of growth and prosperity that helped position the state as a leader in the post-war Midwest. Despite his success as governor, Hayes remained focused on the larger issues facing the nation. He continued to support Reconstruction efforts in the South although he recognized that the process was becoming increasingly difficult as southern states resisted federal authority. Hayes believed that Reconstruction could only succeed if the federal government remained committed to enforcing civil rights laws and ensuring that African Americans were fully integrated into American society. However, by the early 1870s, it was becoming clear that the political will to continue Reconstruction was waning, and Hayes became increasingly concerned about the future of the nation's commitment to equality, as his second term as governor came to an end in 1872, Hayes briefly considered retiring from public life and returning to his legal practice. However, his continued popularity within the Republican Party made it clear that his political career was far from over. In 1875, after a brief hiatus, he was persuaded to run for a third term as governor, which he won with ease. His third term was marked by further efforts to promote economic development and civil rights, but by this time, the national political landscape was shifting. The country was growing weary of Reconstruction, and the Republican Party was beginning to fracture over the issue. Hayes's governorships were characterized by moderation, pragmatism, and a focus on progress through reform. His ability to navigate the difficult political terrain of the post-war period made him one of the most respected leaders in the Midwest and his record of success in Ohio helped position him for future national leadership. As the country prepared for the presidential election of 1876, Hayes's name began to surface as a potential candidate. He had proven himself as a man of integrity and principle, qualities that would be sorely needed in the tumultuous political climate that lay ahead. Part 5. The Controversial Election of 1876 the year 1876 was a pivotal one for the United States. The nation was celebrating its centennial, 
marking 100 years since the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but the country was also deeply divided. Reconstruction had strained the relationship between the North and South, and political corruption was rampant. The Republican Party, which had led the nation through the Civil War and its aftermath, was facing internal divisions, and the Democratic Party, particularly strong in the South, was regaining political power. It was in this climate that the 1876 presidential election took place, an election that would become one of the most controversial in American history. Rutherford B. Hayes, having completed his third term as governor of Ohio, was considered by many within the Republican Party to be an ideal candidate for the presidency. His reputation for honesty and integrity, combined with his moderate stance on Reconstruction and civil rights, made him an appealing choice for a party that was struggling to regain public trust after several scandals under the Grant administration. Though not a nationally prominent figure at the time, Hayes's ability to appeal to both Northern and Southern Republicans made him a compromise candidate who could unify the party. In June 1876, the Republican National Convention nominated Hayes for president. On the Democratic side, New York Governor Samuel J. Tilden was nominated as the party's candidate. Tilden was a popular and well-respected figure, known for his efforts to root out corruption in New York politics, particularly his role in dismantling the infamous Tweed Ring. Like Hayes, Tilden was seen as a reformer, someone who could clean up the corruption that had plagued Washington during the Grant years. The election was set to be a contest between two men who had built their careers on integrity and reform, but the political landscape of the time ensured that the race would be anything but straightforward. As the election campaign progressed, the country remained deeply divided along regional lines. The South, still smarting from the effects of Reconstruction, overwhelmingly supported Tilden and the Democrats. Many white Southerners viewed Reconstruction as an oppressive and corrupt system imposed by Northern Republicans, and they were eager to see federal troops withdrawn from the South and local control restored. The Northern states, particularly those with large Republican majorities, backed Hayes. But even here the party support was not as strong as it had been during the immediate post-war years. The election of 1876 was contentious from the start. Both parties engaged in heavy campaigning, but the nation's attention was largely focused on the South, where the presence of federal troops and the suppression of black voters were major issues. In several southern states, Democratic Party operatives engaged in widespread voter intimidation, using violence and threats to keep African Americans from voting. At the same time, Republicans in the North were accused of engaging in fraud and corruption to secure votes for Hayes. The stage was set for a bitter and controversial election night. When the votes were tallied on November 7, 1876, it quickly became clear that the election was far from decided. Tilden had won the popular vote by a significant margin, securing approximately 250,000 more votes than Hayes. However, the electoral vote, the vote that actually determined the winner, was much more complicated. Tilden had 184 electoral votes, just one short of the 185 needed to win the presidency. Hayes, meanwhile, had 165 electoral votes. The 20 remaining electoral votes from the states of South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana were in dispute. Both parties claimed victory in these states, and allegations of fraud, voter suppression, and intimidation further muddied the situation. With the outcome of the election hanging in the balance, Congress was forced to intervene. The stakes were high. If Tilden were declared the winner, the Democrats would regain control of the White House for the first time since before the Civil War. If Hayes were declared the winner, the Republicans would retain power, but the legitimacy of the election would be called into question. To resolve the impasse, Congress established a special electoral commission, composed of five members from the House of Representatives, five members from the Senate, and five members from the Supreme Court. The commission's task was to review the disputed electoral votes and determine the winner of the election. The commission's work was highly controversial from the outset. Of the 15 members, eight were Republicans and seven were Democrats meaning that the commission's decision would likely favor Hayes. Over the course of several weeks, the commission reviewed the contested electoral votes from South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. After much debate and deliberation, 
the commission awarded all 20 of the disputed votes to Hayes. This gave him a total of 185 electoral votes, just enough to win the presidency. On March 2, 1877, two days before Hayes was to be inaugurated, Congress certified the commission's decision, officially declaring Hayes the winner of the election. However, the outcome of the election did not come without significant concessions. In what became known as the Compromise of 1877, Republican leaders, in exchange for securing the presidency for Hayes, agreed to withdraw federal troops from the South, effectively ending Reconstruction. This compromise marked a turning point in American history. While it resolved the immediate political crisis, it also signaled the end of federal efforts to protect the rights of African Americans in the South. In the years that followed, Southern states enacted a series of laws designed to disenfranchise black voters and impose racial segregation, undoing many of the gains made during Reconstruction. Hayes's victory in the election of 1876 was met with mixed reactions. Many Republicans celebrated the outcome, believing that Hayes's presidency would restore integrity to the White House and bring much-needed reform to the federal government. However, Democrats, particularly in the South, viewed the election as a stolen victory, arguing that Tilden had rightfully won both the popular vote and the disputed electoral votes. This sense of injustice would linger for years, fueling resentment and deepening the divisions between the North and South. For Hayes, the contested election and the compromise that followed would cast a long shadow over his presidency. Although he had won the office, the circumstances of his victory left him in a precarious position. Many Americans viewed his presidency as illegitimate, and Hayes himself was acutely aware of the controversy surrounding his election. In his inaugural address, he sought to calm the tensions, stating that he would be a president for all Americans, regardless of party affiliation or regional loyalty. But the reality of governing a nation still deeply divided by the Civil War and its aftermath would prove to be an enormous challenge. Despite the fraught nature of the 1876 election, Hayes remained committed to his principles of reform and reconciliation. His presidency would be defined by his efforts to heal the nation's wounds, restore trust in government, and promote the rule of law. However, the compromises he made to secure the presidency, particularly the withdrawal of federal troops from the South, would have lasting consequences for the country, especially for the millions of African Americans who were left vulnerable to the resurgence of white supremacist rule in the South. Part 6 the Hayes Presidency and the End of Reconstruction Rutherford B. Hayes assumed the presidency on March 5, 1877, under a cloud of controversy due to the intensely disputed election of 1876. The nation was still reeling from the aftermath of the Civil War, and the Reconstruction era was coming to a turbulent end. Although Hayes had won the presidency through the Compromise of 1877, which effectively ended Reconstruction, his presidency was overshadowed by the perception that it had been secured through backroom deals rather than a clear electoral victory. Despite this, Hayes entered office with a strong commitment to national reconciliation, government reform, and restoring trust in a deeply divided country. One of the first and most consequential acts of Hayes's presidency was the fulfillment of his part in the Compromise of 1877. In exchange for securing the disputed electoral votes and thus the presidency, Hayes had agreed to withdraw the remaining federal troops stationed in the southern states of South Carolina and Louisiana. This action effectively marked the end of Reconstruction, a period in which the federal government had worked to enforce civil rights and rebuild the southern states after the Civil War. Hayes's withdrawal of the troops allowed the southern states to regain full control of their internal affairs, leading to the rise of Redeemer governments white supremacist democratic regimes that quickly began rolling back the civil rights gains made by African Americans during Reconstruction. Hayes's decision to withdraw the troops was highly controversial. While it helped to ease tensions between the North and South and fulfilled his promise of national reconciliation, it also had devastating consequences for African Americans in the South. With federal protection gone, the newly established state governments passed laws that disenfranchised black voters imposed racial segregation, and institutionalized Jim Crow laws, which would remain in place for nearly a century. African Americans, who had enjoyed brief political and social advances during Reconstruction, were once again subjected to systemic oppression and violence. 
Despite the negative consequences of the end of Reconstruction, Hayes genuinely believed that his policies were in the best interest of the country. He sought to create a more stable and unified nation by encouraging reconciliation between the North and South. In his inaugural address, Hayes promised to protect the rights of all citizens, regardless of race, and to promote the return of local self-government to the southern states. He believed that through economic development and education, the South could be integrated into the broader national economy and that racial tensions would eventually ease. However, the reality was far more complex, and the withdrawal of federal oversight allowed southern states to reimpose racial hierarchies. While Hayes's role in ending Reconstruction has defined much of his legacy, his presidency also focused on other significant reforms, particularly in the area of civil service. At the time, the federal government was rife with corruption and inefficiency, largely due to the spoil system, in which government jobs were awarded based on political loyalty rather than merit. Hayes was deeply committed to reforming this system and believed that government positions should be filled by qualified individuals, regardless of their political affiliations. To this end, he introduced several key reforms aimed at reducing the influence of patronage in government appointments. One of Hayes's most notable efforts in this area was his battle with Senator Roscoe Conkling of New York, a powerful Republican leader who controlled a vast patronage network in his state. Conkling's political machine had long dominated federal appointments in New York, and Hayes sought to challenge the system by appointing civil servants based on merit rather than political loyalty. The most dramatic confrontation between Hayes and Conkling came when Hayes attempted to remove Chester A. Arthur, the collector of the Port of New York, from office. Arthur, a close ally of Conkling, was deeply entrenched in the spoils system, and his removal sparked a bitter political battle. Hayes's stand against Conkling and the patronage system was a bold move that demonstrated his commitment to civil service reform. Although Hayes was ultimately successful in removing Arthur from his post, the political cost was high. His efforts alienated many members of his own party, particularly the stalwarts, a faction of the Republican Party that strongly supported the spoil system and opposed reform. Despite this opposition, Hayes's actions laid the groundwork for future civil service reforms, including the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, which would be passed under President Arthur's administration in 1883. In addition to his efforts at civil service reform, Hayes was also committed to improving the nation's economy. The country was still recovering from the Panic of 1873, a severe economic depression that had led to widespread unemployment, bank failures, and business closures. Hayes took a conservative approach to economic policy, believing that the federal government should focus on maintaining a stable currency and reducing the national debt. One of the major economic issues of the time was the debate over hard money versus soft money. The hard money camp, which included Hayes, advocated for a currency backed by gold, while the soft money advocates pushed for the continued use of paper money, or greenbacks, which had been issued during the Civil War. Hayes firmly believed in the gold standard and vetoed the Bland-Allison Act, which would have required the U.S. Treasury to purchase silver and mint it into coins, effectively inflating the money supply. However, Congress overrode his veto, and the act became law in 1878. Despite this setback, Hayes continued to pursue fiscal responsibility and worked to reduce government spending and pay down the national debt. His administration's conservative economic policies helped stabilize the economy, although they did little to address the immediate concerns of working-class Americans who were struggling with unemployment and low wages. One of the most significant labor events of Hayes's presidency was the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. The strike began when several major railroads, facing financial difficulties, cut workers' wages. This led to widespread strikes and violent clashes between workers and company officials across the country. The strike quickly spread to multiple states, crippling the nation's transportation system and threatening to spiral out of control. Hayes, though sympathetic to the workers' plight, ultimately decided to send federal troops to several states to suppress the strikes and restore order. Hayes's decision to use federal troops to quell the railroad strike was controversial. While it successfully brought an end to the violence, many workers and labor leaders viewed it as a betrayal of the working class. The strike highlighted the growing tensions between labor and capital in the rapidly industrializing United States, 
and it underscored the limits of Hayes's moderate approach to economic and social reform. Although Hayes believed in maintaining law and order, his response to the strike alienated many laborers and contributed to the perception that his administration was more aligned with business interests than with the needs of ordinary Americans. In foreign policy, Hayes pursued a relatively cautious and non-interventionist approach. He focused on improving relations with Latin America and enforcing the Monroe Doctrine, which sought to prevent European powers from interfering in the affairs of the Western Hemisphere. One of the key foreign policy issues during his presidency was Chinese immigration. In the years following the Civil War, thousands of Chinese immigrants had come to the United States, particularly to California, to work on the railroads and in other industries. However, rising anti-Chinese sentiment, particularly among white workers who viewed the Chinese as economic competition, led to calls for restrictions on Chinese immigration. In response to this growing backlash, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which sought to severely restrict Chinese immigration. Hayes, however, vetoed the bill, arguing that it violated existing treaties with China and was inconsistent with American principles of fairness and equality. His veto of the Chinese Exclusion Act was unpopular in many parts of the country, particularly in the West, where anti-Chinese sentiment was strongest. Although Hayes's veto was ultimately overturned after he left office, his stand against the exclusion of Chinese immigrants reflected his broader commitment to fairness and justice, even in the face of public opposition. By the end of his presidency in 1881, Rutherford B. Hayes had left a mixed legacy. While he succeeded in restoring a degree of integrity to the White House after the scandals of the Grant administration and made important strides in civil service reform, his role in ending Reconstruction and his handling of the railroad strikes cast a long shadow over his tenure. Hayes had entered office with a promise of national reconciliation, and in many ways, he succeeded in calming the immediate post-Civil War tensions. However, the compromises he made to achieve that reconciliation, particularly in the South, had lasting consequences that would shape the course of American history for decades to come. Part 7. Domestic Policies and Civil Service Reform As Rutherford B. Hayes began his presidency in 1877, one of the key areas where he sought to leave a lasting impact was domestic policy, particularly in the realm of civil service reform. At the time, the U.S. government was plagued by widespread corruption, much of it rooted in the spoil system a practice in which political supporters were rewarded with government jobs regardless of their qualifications. Hayes, a man known for his integrity and desire to restore public trust in government, made civil service reform a central focus of his administration. He believed that the federal government should function based on merit and competence, not political favoritism, and he was determined to take steps to achieve that goal. The spoil system had been a fixture of American politics for decades, and dismantling it would be no easy task. For years, political patronage had been the currency of power, with both parties relying on the promise of government jobs to secure loyalty and build influence. Hayes knew that to reform the system, he would have to confront entrenched interests within his own Republican Party, including powerful political machines that controlled key appointments in various states. This put him on a collision course with influential party bosses like Senator Roscoe Conkling of New York a leader of the stalwart faction of the Republican Party that staunchly supported the spoil system. One of Hayes's most significant actions in his pursuit of civil service reform was his attempt to remove Chester A. Arthur from his position as collector of the Port of New York. The position of port collector was one of the most lucrative and politically powerful in the federal government, as it controlled customs revenue, a major source of income for the Treasury. Arthur, a close ally of Senator Conkling, had used the position to distribute patronage jobs to loyal Republicans in New York. Hayes viewed Arthur's control of the port as a symbol of the corruption that he wanted to eliminate, and he made the bold decision to replace Arthur with a civil servant of his choosing. The decision to remove Arthur sparked a fierce political battle between Hayes and Conkling. Conkling, who saw the removal as a direct attack on his power, used every means at his disposal to block Hayes's reforms. The Senate, which was dominated by Conkling's allies, refused to confirm Hayes's nominee for the port collector position, leading to a prolonged standoff. Despite the opposition, Hayes stood firm, eventually using his executive authority to bypass the Senate and appoint his candidate during a congressional recess. 
This move, while controversial, signaled Hayes's determination to push through civil service reform regardless of the political cost. Hayes's victory in the battle over the New York Custom House was a major milestone in his efforts to reform the federal government. Although the battle over the spoil system continued for years after Hayes left office, his actions laid the foundation for future reforms. The removal of Arthur and other corrupt officials demonstrated that government jobs could not be handed out solely for political purposes and that merit should play a central role in public service. Hayes's stand against political patronage also paved the way for the eventual passage of the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act in 1883, which established a merit-based system for federal employment and required competitive exams for many government positions. In addition to his efforts at civil service reform, Hayes sought to bring greater accountability and transparency to the federal government in other ways. He implemented reforms to reduce wasteful government spending, particularly in the military and civil service departments. Recognizing the importance of restoring public confidence in the federal government after the scandals of the Grant administration, Hayes worked to ensure that his administration was free from the corruption that had characterized the previous decade. He made it clear that he expected the highest standards of integrity from his cabinet members and other officials, and he took swift action when instances of misconduct were uncovered. Beyond civil service reform, Hayes's domestic policies were also shaped by the broader economic challenges facing the country in the late 1870s. The nation was still recovering from the Panic of 1873, which had led to widespread unemployment and economic hardship. The economic depression had fueled discontent among many working-class Americans, particularly in the industrializing northern states. Hayes, a fiscal conservative, believed that the best way to restore economic stability was through sound monetary policy and reduced government spending. He was a staunch advocate of the gold standard and opposed the use of greenbacks, the paper currency issued during the Civil War, as a means of inflating the currency. One of the most contentious economic debates during Hayes's presidency was over the Bland-Allison Act, which called for the federal government to purchase large amounts of silver and mint it into coins. This would have expanded the money supply, leading to inflation, a policy favored by many farmers and debtors who hoped that higher inflation would reduce the real value of their debts. Hayes, however, was opposed to the inflationary policies and believed that maintaining the gold standard was essential to long-term economic stability. In 1878, he vetoed the Bland-Allison Act, arguing that it would undermine the nation's financial health. However, Congress overrode his veto, and the law was enacted, marking a significant defeat for Hayes on the monetary policy front. Hayes's conservative economic policies also put him at odds with the growing labor movement in the United States. One of the most significant challenges of his presidency came in 1877 with the outbreak of the Great Railroad Strike. The strike began when several major railroad companies, struggling to cope with the economic downturn, cut workers' wages. This led to a wave of strikes and violent protests by railroad workers, who blocked rail lines, attacked company property, and clashed with local authorities. The strike quickly spread to several states, causing a national crisis as the country's transportation system ground to a halt. Hayes, while sympathetic to the workers' grievances, felt that his primary responsibility as president was to maintain law and order. After local authorities proved unable to contain the violence, Hayes made the difficult decision to send federal troops to several states, including West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Illinois, to quell the strikes and restore peace. The use of federal troops to suppress the strike was highly controversial and drew widespread criticism from labor groups, who accused Hayes of siding with the railroad companies over the working class. However, Hayes believed that the violence and disruption posed a serious threat to national stability, and he defended his decision as necessary to protect public safety and property. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877 was a turning point in the nation's labor history. While Hayes's actions succeeded in ending the strike, the events underscored the growing tensions between labor and capital in the United States. The strike revealed the deep frustrations of the working class, who felt that their concerns were being ignored by both business leaders and government officials. Although Hayes's response to the strike was criticized by labor groups, it set a precedent for the use of federal troops in domestic conflicts, a practice that would be employed in future labor disputes. Despite the challenges he faced, 
Hayes remained committed to his vision of reforming the federal government and promoting economic stability. Throughout his presidency, he maintained a focus on reducing corruption, promoting fiscal responsibility, and ensuring that the government functioned efficiently and effectively. While some of his policies were unpopular, particularly among labor groups and those who favored inflationary economic measures, Hayes's commitment to integrity and sound governance earned him respect for many quarters. He believed that restoring trust in the government was essential to healing the divisions that had plagued the country since the Civil War, and his efforts to reform the civil service and maintain fiscal discipline were central to that goal. As Hayes's presidency neared its end in 1881, he reflected on the progress he had made, particularly in terms of civil service reform. Although he had not been able to achieve all of his goals, his administration had succeeded in taking important steps toward reducing corruption and establishing a merit-based system of government employment. These reforms, though incomplete, would have a lasting impact on the federal government and help shape future efforts to professionalize the civil service. Hayes's commitment to reform and his willingness to stand up to powerful political forces set a precedent for future presidents, including those who would continue the fight for civil service reform in the decades to come. Part 8 Economic Challenges and the Railroad Strike of 1877 Rutherford B. Hayes's presidency was marked by numerous economic challenges, many of which were rooted in the aftershocks of the Panic of 1873. The panic had triggered a prolonged economic depression that affected almost every aspect of American life. Business failures, unemployment, and wage cuts were rampant, and many Americans were struggling to make ends meet. This economic downturn created widespread dissatisfaction, especially among laborers, who felt that they were being unfairly targeted with wage cuts while the wealthier industrialists seemed to suffer few consequences. Hayes, as a fiscal conservative, entered office with the goal of stabilizing the economy by promoting responsible government spending and sound monetary policy, but the economic environment proved to be extremely volatile. One of the most significant events during Hayes's presidency was the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the first major nationwide labor conflict in American history. The strike began in July of that year when the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad announced a 10% wage cut, the second such cut in a short period. For the already underpaid and overworked railroad laborers, this was the final straw. In response, workers in Martinsburg, West Virginia, walked off the job and seized control of the local rail lines. The strike quickly spread to other cities and states, becoming a national movement as workers from other railroads joined in. The economic depression of the 1870s had made life incredibly difficult for laborers, especially those working for the major railroad companies, which were some of the most powerful and profitable businesses in the country. For these workers, the wage cuts symbolized the growing inequality between the working class and the wealthy industrialists who controlled the nation's railroads. The railroad companies had consistently increased profits, even during the Depression, while reducing the wages of their employees and demanding longer working hours. This disparity fueled widespread anger and resentment, which quickly boiled over into a full-blown labor revolt. As the strike spread across the country, it became increasingly violent. In cities like Pittsburgh, Chicago, and Baltimore, workers clashed with police and militia forces. Rail lines were blocked, train cars were set on fire, and railroad property was destroyed. The situation became especially dangerous in Pittsburgh, where violent confrontations between striking workers and state militia resulted in dozens of deaths and the destruction of millions of dollars worth of property, the unrest paralyzed the nation's transportation network, disrupting commerce and communication across the country. Hayes, although sympathetic to the grievances of the workers, believed that maintaining law and order was paramount. The disruption caused by the strike threatened not only the economy but also the stability of the nation as a whole. After local and state authorities proved unable to contain the violence and restore order, Hayes made the difficult decision to intervene with federal troops. This was a significant and controversial step, as it marked one of the first times in U.S. history that the federal government used military force to suppress a labor dispute. Federal troops were dispatched to several states, including West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Maryland, to quell the violence and restore rail service. The presence of federal troops had an immediate effect, 
as many of the striking workers, faced with overwhelming military force, either returned to work or dispersed. In some areas, however, the violence continued, and the conflict between striking workers and government forces escalated further before finally subsiding. By August, the strike had largely been suppressed, but the cost had been high. Over 100 people were killed, and millions of dollars in property damage had been inflicted. The strike had revealed the deep tensions between labor and capital in the rapidly industrializing United States. Hayes's decision to send in federal troops to break the strike was met with mixed reactions. Many business leaders praised his actions, viewing them as necessary to protect private property and restore order to the country's critical transportation infrastructure. However, labor unions and working-class Americans saw Hayes's actions as an attack on their rights and an indication that the federal government was firmly aligned with the interests of big business. For these groups, the use of military force to suppress the strike was a clear signal that their grievances were being ignored by those in power. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877 also had significant political ramifications for Hayes. While he had managed to end the immediate crisis and restore order, the strike highlighted the growing social and economic divisions in the country, divisions that his administration had not adequately addressed. In the aftermath of the strike, labor unrest continued to simmer, and the relationship between workers and industrial capitalists grew even more strained. Although Hayes had hoped that his policies of fiscal conservatism and limited government intervention would stabilize the economy, the strike underscored the reality that many working Americans were suffering under the weight of economic inequality. The economic challenges of the 1870s were further complicated by ongoing debates over monetary policy. One of the most contentious issues of Hayes's presidency was the debate between the advocates of hard money, gold-backed currency, and soft money, inflationary paper currency. In the years following the Civil War, the federal government had issued large amounts of paper money, known as greenbacks, to help finance the war effort. However, after the war, there was growing pressure to return to a currency backed by gold, which would ensure that the money supply remained stable and limited. Many business leaders and bankers supported the gold standard, believing that it would promote long-term economic stability and encourage investment. On the other hand, many farmers, debtors, and laborers favored the continued use of greenbacks or the introduction of silverback currency, which would increase the money supply and lead to inflation. These groups believed that inflation would make it easier for them to pay off their debts and would stimulate economic growth. The debate over the money supply came to a head with the passage of the Bland-Allison Act in 1878, which required the U.S. Treasury to purchase a certain amount of silver and mint it into coins. This compromise was seen as a middle ground between the hard money advocates, who wanted to stick with gold, and the soft money proponents, who wanted to inflate the currency with silver and greenbacks. Hayes, a firm believer in the gold standard, vetoed the Bland-Allison Act, arguing that it would undermine the country's economic stability by inflating the money supply and reducing the value of the dollar. He believed that a stable, gold-backed currency was essential to promoting long-term economic growth and protecting the purchasing power of American consumers. However, Congress overrode his veto, and the act became law, leading to the minting of millions of silver coins in the years that followed. Although Hayes had lost the battle over monetary policy, he remained committed to fiscal responsibility throughout his presidency, continuing to advocate for sound money and reduced government spending. The economic policies of Hayes's presidency reflected his broader belief in limited government intervention in the economy. He favored a hands-off approach that prioritized balanced budgets, low inflation, and long-term financial stability. However, his reluctance to intervene more aggressively in the economy, particularly during the labor unrest of 1877, left many workers feeling abandoned by the federal government. The Great Railroad Strike and the economic challenges of the 1870s highlighted the deep structural problems facing the country as it transitioned to an industrial economy, problems that would continue to shape American politics for decades to come. Hayes's handling of the Great Railroad Strike and the economic issues of his time were defining aspects of his presidency. While he succeeded in restoring order and promoting fiscal discipline, his policies often alienated working-class Americans, who felt that their concerns were being ignored in favor of protecting the interests of big business. 
The strike revealed the deep economic and social divisions that had been exacerbated by the rapid industrialization of the United States, divisions that would continue to grow in the years following Hayes' presidency. Although he left office in 1881, having stabilized the economy to some extent, the unresolved tensions between labor and capital would remain a central issue in American politics for years to come. Part 9. Foreign Policy and Diplomatic Initiatives while Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency is often remembered for domestic challenges such as the Great Railroad Strike and civil service reform, his foreign policy approach was also significant. Hayes' philosophy on international relations was grounded in the belief that the United States should avoid unnecessary entanglements in foreign conflicts, focus on building stronger relationships with neighboring countries in the Western Hemisphere, and protect American interests abroad. He adhered to a policy of pragmatism and caution understanding that the nation's primary focus should be on healing the divisions left by the Civil War and managing the post-Reconstruction economy. His foreign policy, though not as eventful as those of some of his successors, helped to lay the groundwork for the United States' role in the world at the turn of the century. One of Hayes's key foreign policy goals was to reinforce the principles of the Monroe Doctrine. This doctrine, established in 1823 by President James Monroe, declared that the Western Hemisphere was off-limits to further European colonization and interference. Although the Monroe Doctrine had been a cornerstone of American foreign policy for decades, Hayes believed that it needed to be more actively enforced, particularly in the context of growing European interest in Latin America. He was particularly concerned about the possibility of European powers gaining influence in countries like Mexico and the Caribbean nations which could threaten American economic and strategic interests in the region. In keeping with the Monroe Doctrine, Hayes worked to prevent European intervention in Latin American affairs. One of the most notable instances of this occurred during a dispute between the United States and Germany over the strategic Samoan Islands in the Pacific. Germany had shown interest in establishing a greater presence in the Pacific, and the United States viewed this as a potential threat to its own aspirations in the region. Although the conflict would escalate after Hayes left office, his administration set the stage for later negotiations aimed at preventing a direct confrontation with Germany and securing American interests in Samoa. This careful balancing act reflected Hayes's diplomatic approach, avoiding unnecessary conflicts while asserting American influence where it mattered. Hayes was also concerned about European colonialism closer to home, particularly in Latin America. His administration took steps to strengthen diplomatic ties with countries such as Mexico and the Central American nations, seeking to establish the United States as the dominant influence in the Western Hemisphere. Hayes believed that the economic and political stability of Latin America was inextricably linked to the security and prosperity of the United States. His administration supported trade agreements and encouraged American investment in Latin America as a way to strengthen these ties and reduce the influence of European powers. By promoting economic cooperation and political stability in the region, Hayes hoped to ensure that Latin American countries would remain aligned with U.S. interests. Another significant area of Hayes's foreign policy was his approach to China and the question of Chinese immigration. During the 19th century, thousands of Chinese immigrants came to the United States, particularly to California, to work on the transcontinental railroads and in other industries. While these immigrants played a vital role in the development of the American West, they were increasingly met with hostility and discrimination, especially from white laborers who viewed them as competition for jobs. By the time Hayes took office, there was growing political pressure to restrict Chinese immigration, and this issue became one of the most contentious aspects of his foreign policy. In 1880, as anti-Chinese sentiment intensified on the West Coast, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act which sought to severely restrict Chinese immigration and limit the rights of Chinese laborers already in the United States. Hayes, however, vetoed the bill, arguing that it violated the terms of the Berlingame Treaty, an agreement between the United States and China that promoted open immigration and trade between the two nations. Hayes believed that honoring international agreements was essential to maintaining America's credibility on the global stage and he was unwilling to support legislation that he viewed as discriminatory and in breach of U.S. treaty obligations. While Hayes's veto of the Chinese Exclusion Act was a principled stand, it was deeply unpopular in many parts of the country, particularly in California, 
where anti-Chinese sentiment was strongest. The political backlash against Hayes was swift, with many Americans accusing him of being out of touch with the economic and social realities of the time. Despite the criticism, Hayes's veto reflected his broader commitment to fairness and the rule of law, even when it was politically risky. His decision temporarily delayed the passage of anti-Chinese legislation, though the Chinese Exclusion Act would eventually be signed into law under President Chester A. Arthur in 1882, after Hayes had left office. Beyond immigration and international treaties, Hayes also took steps to modernize and strengthen the U.S. Navy. During the post-Civil War years, the American Navy had fallen into disrepair, and many of its ships were outdated and ineffective. Hayes recognized the importance of maintaining a strong naval presence to protect American interests abroad, particularly in the Caribbean and the Pacific. His administration initiated efforts to modernize the Navy by building new, more advanced ships and improving naval infrastructure. Although these efforts were relatively modest during Hayes's presidency, they laid the groundwork for the larger naval expansion that would take place in the following decades. Hayes's foreign policy also reflected his interest in promoting peaceful diplomacy and resolving disputes without resorting to military conflict. One example of this was his administration's handling of the Ten Years' War, a Cuban rebellion against Spanish colonial rule that lasted from 1868 to 1878. While many Americans, particularly in the South, supported the Cuban rebels and called for U.S. intervention, Hayes took a more cautious approach. He believed that direct military involvement in Cuba could lead to a larger conflict with Spain, which the United States was not prepared to fight. Instead, Hayes sought to mediate between the Spanish government and the Cuban rebels, hoping to find a diplomatic solution that would protect American interests without embroiling the country in a costly war. In line with his non-interventionist foreign policy, Hayes also avoided entangling the United States in European conflicts. At the time, Europe was undergoing significant political and territorial shifts, particularly with the unification of Germany and Italy and the growing tensions between European powers over colonial territories. While some American leaders advocated for a more aggressive stance in global affairs, particularly in relation to European colonialism in Africa and Asia, Hayes remained focused on protecting American interests closer to home. He believed that the United States should focus on building its own strength and stability rather than becoming involved in distant conflicts that did not directly threaten the nation. One of Hayes's most enduring foreign policy legacies was his emphasis on diplomacy as a tool for protecting American interests. While his administration did not face any major foreign policy crises, Hayes worked to strengthen the U.S. State Department and professionalize the country's diplomatic corps. He believed that diplomacy should be conducted by skilled professionals who understood the complexities of international relations, rather than by political appointees with little experience in foreign affairs. This focus on building a strong, professional diplomatic service helped improve the effectiveness of American diplomacy and set the stage for the more active foreign policy that would emerge in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although foreign policy was not the dominant focus of Hayes' presidency, his administration made important contributions to America's role in the world. By reinforcing the Monroe Doctrine, vetoing discriminatory immigration legislation, and promoting peaceful diplomacy, Hayes helped to shape the nation's approach to international relations during a critical period of transition. His efforts to protect American interests while avoiding unnecessary conflicts reflected a broader belief that the United States should remain a force for stability in the Western Hemisphere. While his cautious approach to foreign policy may not have garnered as much attention as his domestic reforms, it played an important role in ensuring that the country remained secure and focused on its internal challenges. As Hayes neared the end of his presidency in 1881, he could reflect on a foreign policy record that was marked by pragmatism, restraint, and a commitment to upholding American values. Although his administration did not face major wars or international crises, Hayes's careful diplomacy and focus on strengthening America's position in the Western Hemisphere helped to lay the groundwork for future presidents. His emphasis on fairness, legality, and peaceful negotiation set a tone for American foreign policy that would continue to resonate in the decades to come. Even as the United States grew more involved in global affairs after Hayes's presidency, his belief in diplomacy and restraint would continue to influence the nation's approach to the world. Part 10. 
Retirement and Legacy When Rutherford B. Hayes left the White House in March 1881, he did so having fulfilled a promise he made during his campaign, to serve only one term. His departure from the presidency marked the end of a turbulent and challenging period in American history, but Hayes' contributions, particularly his efforts to reform the federal government, reconcile a divided nation, and navigate the complexities of the post-Reconstruction era, left a lasting impact. However, Hayes's work was far from over, as he continued to dedicate his life to public service, education reform, and charitable causes during his retirement. After leaving office, Hayes returned to his family home, Spiegel Grove, in Fremont, Ohio. There, he settled into a quieter life with his beloved wife, Lucy Webb Hayes, and their children. Hayes's love for his family and his deep connection to his home provided him with a sense of peace and purpose in his post-presidential years. While he was no longer in the public spotlight, he remained active in civic affairs and continued to advocate for the causes he had championed throughout his political career. One of the most significant aspects of Hayes's retirement was his dedication to education. He believed deeply in the transformative power of education, particularly as a means of uplifting individuals and strengthening democratic society. Hayes often spoke of the importance of providing educational opportunities for all citizens, regardless of race, gender, or socioeconomic background. He was particularly concerned with the education of African Americans, whose progress had been severely curtailed by the end of Reconstruction and the rise of discriminatory Jim Crow laws in the South. To further his commitment to education, Hayes became involved with several educational institutions and organizations. He served as a trustee for his alma mater, Kenyon College, and was instrumental in establishing Ohio State University as a leading public institution. Hayes believed that public education was essential to the future success of the country, and he worked tirelessly to promote access to higher education for all Americans. His support for Ohio State University, in particular, helped lay the foundation for its eventual growth into one of the largest and most respected universities in the United States. Hayes's commitment to the education of African Americans extended beyond rhetoric. He actively supported institutions that provided education and vocational training for black students, including the Hampton Institute in Virginia. Hampton was founded to provide African Americans with practical skills and education that would help them succeed in the post-slavery economy. Hayes saw education as the most effective way to improve the lives of African Americans and ensure their full integration into American society. He also believed that education could serve as a means of breaking down racial barriers and fostering greater understanding between the races. In addition to his work in education, Hayes was deeply involved in prison reform. He believed that the American prison system needed significant reform to focus more on rehabilitation rather than simply punishment. Hayes argued that individuals who had committed crimes should be given opportunities to learn new skills, receive education, and reintegrate into society as productive citizens. This approach to prison reform was progressive for its time and reflected Hayes's broader belief in the capacity for individuals to improve their lives through education and personal development. Hayes's post-presidential years were also marked by his involvement in numerous charitable organizations. He was a strong advocate for veterans and their families, having served in the Union Army during the Civil War, and he continued to support initiatives that provided assistance to those who had served the country. He was particularly concerned with the welfare of soldiers who had been wounded in the war, and he worked to improve access to medical care and pensions for veterans. This dedication to veterans' rights and care reflected Hayes's deep sense of duty and responsibility to those who had fought for the Union. Despite his many contributions to public life during his retirement, Hayes's legacy remained complicated, particularly in the South, where his presidency is often remembered for the end of Reconstruction. The Compromise of 1877, which led to Hayes's election, also resulted in the withdrawal of federal troops from the South and the resurgence of white supremacist governments that systematically disenfranchised African Americans. While Hayes genuinely believed that the withdrawal would lead to reconciliation and peace between the North and South, the reality was far more grim. The end of Reconstruction marked the beginning of a long period of racial segregation and discrimination that would last well into the 20th century. Hayes's presidency also faced criticism from labor groups, 
particularly in the aftermath of the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. His decision to send federal troops to suppress the strike alienated many workers and labor unions, who viewed his actions as favoring big business over the rights of labor. Although Hayes had sought to restore order during a time of economic and social unrest, his response to the strike left a lasting impression on the labor movement, which saw the federal government as an enforcer of corporate interests. These aspects of Hayes's legacy continued to shape how he was remembered in the years following his presidency. Despite these controversies, Hayes's commitment to civil service reform remains one of his most enduring contributions to American politics. His efforts to root out corruption in government and establish a merit-based system of public employment laid the groundwork for future reforms, including the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883. Hayes's stand against the spoil system, particularly his battle with Senator Roscoe Conkling over appointments in New York, demonstrated his willingness to challenge powerful political forces in order to improve the integrity of the federal government. This commitment to reform helped restore public trust in the presidency and the federal government after the scandals of the Grant administration. Hayes's legacy is also remembered through his deep commitment to education, civil rights, and prison reform. His belief in the power of education to transform lives and his advocacy for the rights of African Americans helped pave the way for future generations of reformers. Although his policies on race were limited by the political realities of his time, Hayes's work in promoting education for African Americans and supporting civil rights initiatives reflected his belief in equality and justice. His post-presidential work in these areas helped establish him as a compassionate and forward-thinking leader committed to improving the lives of all Americans. Rutherford B. Hayes passed away on January 17, 1893, at the age of 70. His death marked the end of a long and storied career in public service, but his legacy lived on through the institutions and reforms he helped create. Hayes's post-presidential work in education, veterans' rights, and prison reform continued to inspire others, and his efforts to promote civil service reform helped lay the foundation for a more professional and accountable federal government. In many ways, Hayes's life was a testament to the values of integrity, duty, and service that he championed throughout his career. Today, Rutherford B. Hayes is remembered as a president who took office under extraordinary circumstances and worked diligently to bring integrity and reform to the federal government. While his presidency was not without its challenges and controversies, particularly in regard to Reconstruction and labor unrest, Hayes's commitment to honesty, fairness, and public service helped restore faith in the presidency at a critical time in American history. His post-presidential work further solidified his legacy as a compassionate and dedicated leader who believed in the power of education and the importance of civic responsibility. Hayes's life and legacy continue to be studied and appreciated by historians and scholars, who recognize his contributions to the ongoing evolution of American democracy. Thanks for joining us on this journey through the life of Rutherford. We hope you enjoyed learning about his legacy from his efforts in civil service reform to his dedication to education Stay tuned for more deep dives into history's most intriguing figures only here at BM Research.